Hello. So I'll be talking about a security framework, um, which is called the, the AAA model. And I'll be talking about different uh, features in Postgres. It's not working. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Probably going to turn that on. Uh, that go under those three elements. Um, this is a fairly basic talk. Um, this would be considered entry level. Uh, quick question, how many of you are new to Postgres? One, two, three. Some of you. Uh, how many of you are intermediate with Postgres? A few more. OK. Um, so this should be a good talk for you then. <laughs> so the AAA model is a useful security framework which controls access to resources, authorizes what the users can access, and creates an audit trail um, to keep a record of all access data. It's technically a security model used in networking administration, particularly in um, Cisco, actually. Um, in fact, in Cisco, it's used as a um, system which can be enabled for security use. However, I feel that the three core elements um, can be applied to develop a security framework for almost any piece of software, including Postgres, because it, it's pretty intuitive. It covers all the main aspects of security. So first, you have authentication. Uh, this identifies a user. You know, examples include username, password combinations, biometrics, you know, simple stuff. However, it does not determine what actions the user can perform uh, or what the user can access. It only verifies who the user is. Next, you have authorization, which determines what the, um, what the user can then access or select from or view. Um, it obviously protects sensitive information from alteration or deletion. And finally, you have accounting. Uh, which logs everything that the user does, um, the date time of when they logged in, um, and this can obviously point, um, direct you to finding out flaws in your database if you run into problems. So I would like to start with an overview of PostgreSQL.conf, which is an important configuration file for Postgres settings. It's um, in most Debian-based distributions, it's located under slash etc slash postgresql slash version slash main. Um, however, if you're not using this, you can always find it by lo uh, logging into a Postgres session as a super user and asking it to show data directory or show config file. Um, you edit it using a normal text editor, such as VI or Vim. And to comment, use a hash mark Commenting a line is equivalent to deleting a line or restoring it to the default. Um, you have to reload your database after um, recommenting a line for most parameters to take effect. However, there are a few which do require a restart. Um, I'll go into um, how to find out which ones require restart or reload in just a minute. Um, I also wanted to quickly mention the difference between reloading and restarting for those of you who might not know. Uh, restarting actually starts and stops the database, so you'll end up having downtime, while reload sends a SIGHUB si signal, causing Postgres to reread the configuration file. So therefore, there's no downtime. Um, oh, and quick mention, I have links to the documentation at the bottom of most of my slides for those of you who would like to find out more information. So um, under, under the configuration file, there's a section called Security and Authentication. Um, first, you have authentication timeout, which is currently, the default is one minute. It prevents hung clients from occupying a connection, and it breaks the connection if authentication is taking too long. Um, then you have a bunch of SSL parameters. So you first have SSL is true, um, that's a true-false Boolean statement. Um, you have SSL ciphers, which lists um, all those ciphers that are allowed for use on secured connections. Uh, the renegotiation limit, which specifies how much data can flow over an SSL connection before renegotiation takes place. Um, you have the two uh, snake oil files, which are um, they're generated by default encryption certs, and the encryption level is viewed as better than nothing. Uh, then you have <laughs> The SSL CA file and SSL CR files, uh, that's where the locations would be. And um, password encryption, that specifies whether or not passwords are stored encrypted. Um, and DB user namespace, which is by default turned off. It allows per database usernames um, 
which it means usernames are appended to specific databases. Um, if it's turned on, you have to create users as username at database name. Um, and at this point, it's a temporary measure until, until a complete solution is found. At this point, this option will be completely removed. Uh, there's also a section on Kerberos and Gestapi. I just want to mention it's here under this section. However, I will not be um, going into it as it is beyond the scope of this talk. So another way of viewing server settings is through PG settings. You can access these through the database itself in a session rather than outside of it as with a configuration file. And it contains mostly the same parameters as the configuration file with the addition of some internal values. It also provides a convenient way to see which parameters require restart or reload after change with the context column. So there's five types of context, um, internal, which means um, it's an internal server val value and it cannot be changed directly. Uh, postmaster, which means it requires restart. Sighub, which means it requires reload. Um, super user, which means it can be changed inside the session by a super user. And a user, which means it can be changed by any user in the session. And the super user, and of course all these can be changed in the um, configuration file itself uh, other than internal. So this is um, an expanded display, by the way. Um, if it wasn't, then all the columns would be going off the screen. Um, I have here an example of selecting a parameter from PG settings, which is select star from PG settings, rename an authentication timeout. Um, I'm just selecting that one parameter just to show you what the columns are. So you can see that um, it's currently set to 60 seconds. Um, it gives you a category and a short description of the parameter. Um, if it required it, it would also have an extra description. It's set to SIG hub, which means it requires a reload if you change it. For example, if you wanted to change it to 180 seconds. Um, there's a boot val and reset val, val, which are basically the default settings, and source file, which is, um, it tells you where the parameter was changed, if it had been changed. And here, I'm just selecting four columns just to show the difference between um, expand display and not expand display. This is psql only. Um, normally, um, it displays everything with all the columns going across horizontally. If you want to turn on expand display, it sets them uh, vertically. It makes it easier to see. So then we have create role with login, which is effectively the same as create user. Uh, you know, like I said, this creates a username password combination. Um, as it pertains to authentication, it has parameters to set username, password, the expiration time for the user's password, and also specifies whether the password is stored and encrypted. So if you wanted to create a user with password valid until October 10th, you could do it with that command. And of course, you can always change, change the parameters to make it suit your needs. And if you want to drop the user, just simply drop the role. Um, any questions at this point? Um, next up is pga.conf. Now, the website definition of this is that it's a configuration file that controls client authentication. Um, but if you go back to my definitions, I believe that it would be actually an authorization method for reasons which I'll go into a bit later on. Um, it's located in PG data. Uh, you can always ask Postgres in a super user session, um, show HBA underscore file. Um, and it specifies the connection type, IP address range, database name, username, and authentication method used for connections that match. These are all the different authentication types that you can use um, when you're setting up your PGA um, file. First, you have trust, which allows full access. So obviously, this is very insecure uh, because you can log in as any existing user. Uh, reject, which can be used as a ban because you can uh, reject all access to specific databases, to specific users or IP ranges. Um, MD5, which um, requires a user to provide a password that is then MD5 salted and hashed by the client. Password which is a password that is stored and sent in clear text. This is deprecated because it's very insecure. 
um, peer, which checks for a match between a client username and database username. Um, and then you have a variety of various external server authentication methods, uh, such as SOPI, IDENT, KRB5 um, for TCP IP connections, um, SSPI for Windows only, LDAP, RADIUS, and PAM. The external methods can prevent password attack, such as uh, weak passwords, reuse of old passwords, and brute force password attacks. Finally, you have uh, SSL. Oops, forgot to change that, sorry. Um, so users are normally included in the authentication process using a username password combination. However, they're a weak link, no offense. It's much more secure to use SSL as it mitigates a wide variety of um, storage and transmission weak points. Um, it's normally used as a standard security technology for establishing an um, encrypted link between a server and a client, um, which I will not be going over in this talk, but I will be talking about how it can be used to authenticate users via certificates. Um, the certificate is issued by a certification authority who verifies that the user is who they say they are using a cryptographic public key. Um, the verifier is a distinct entity who can't impersonate the user, and um, certificates separate the user from what authenticates the user, and they're also not vulnerable to phishing attacks, man in the middle, or eavesdropping. It's also good to use two-factor authentication, for example, to put a password on the private key. You can never go wrong with being too secure. So if you want to set up SSL, one of the important things to mention is that you always have to set SSL to on in PostgreSQL.conf. By default, it's set to off. Um, the server certificate and private key must exist. They're named server.crt and server.key. Um, they're located in PG data, and you can rename or relocate them by modifying the SSL cert files and um, SSL key files. So there's four main files that are relevant for SSL setup and modification. Um, these are located in PG data. Um, these include the SSL key file, which contains the private key, SSL um, cert file, which contains a server certificate, um, the CA file, which contains the trusted certificate authority, which signed your certificate, and the CRL file, which lists certificates that were revoked by the certificate authorities. So, fully authenticated SSL certificates take a wild issue, as the central management system checks pretty thoroughly um, to make sure that the business is legitimate. They check to confirm the existence of the business, the domain ownership, and the user's authority in that business. So, if you're having it signed by a public certification authority, you need to generate a cert signing request, submit the CSR to the CA using the process and pay, wait a long while for them to sign it, um, and download a signed cert from the CA and install the CA chain and sign cert with your already, um, already generated private key. Uh, there's also domain validated certificates, which are not as secure. They're considered entry level SSL certificates. They're issued quickly as the only verification performed is whether or not the applicant owns the, the domain where their certificate is going to be used. And finally, you have uh, self-signed certificates. Um, they're not issued by CA, and they're not considered to hold any weight when it comes to security or trust. Um, purists would argue that they're only good for testing purposes. Um, however, they're often used um, in businesses or in universities for small local communities. So if you wanted to do this, you would first set up um, the server.key. You first become root, uh, change directory to PD data. Um, then you would um, generate a private key with a passphrase that you have to provide. Um, the next command is if you want to remove the passphrase, you can. Um, you set permissions on the key file and then set the owner on the key file. Next, you have to cr actually create the self-signed certificate. So by doing that top command there, you'd need to um, fill in the requested information that it asks for. Um, you can enter the local host name as common name, and the challenge password can be left blank. Um, the program will generate a passphrase protected key with a minimum of four characters. Um, and then the 
command with the dash x509, I just wanted to point out the dash x509 is what actually makes it self-signed and, and not a certificate request. So finally, you'd want to use a server certificate as trusted root certificate by copy server CRT to root CRT. Um, then two more important things to do is to um, add those two lines to pghpa.conf. Um, they're normally there by default, just commented out. However, if they're not, you can always reference that. And then you'll need to access postgresql.conf and turn SSL to on. Finally, restart Postgres. You'll also need to export your public cert to make it available to others in order for the connection to work prop, um, appropriately. So we're back to pghpa.com, um, but this time it's under authorization. So like I mentioned before, on the official website, it's described as being an authentication method. However, you know, authentication is a verification of a user, nothing else. Authorization is what denies or allows access to resources based on who the user is. The file is read through top to bottom one entry at a time. When a match is found, the search is stopped and allows or rejects connection based on the entry. Therefore, it is allowing or denying access to the database or connection, which is why I consider it to be mainly in an um, authorization method. There's three types of connections. Um, host, which specifies remote host allowed to connect to the server. Um, these can only be TCP IP connections. Then you have local, which specifies BSD socket connections, not TCP IP. They're used for client connections initiated from the same machine that the server is on. And then you have host SSL, which specifies remote and or local host that can connect using SSL. You can also specify, of course, a single database rather than all, specific users rather than all, um, corresponding IP addresses for TCP IP connections, and finally, authentication methods for authenticating the connection as we talked about earlier. Uh, this is uh, the default file. Just wanted to mention that. So here are some common examples of what you might want to do with PGHPA. Uh, these include allowing a single TCP IP connection uh, rejecting a single TCP IP connection, um, connecting a single host to the database, um, foo, uh, allowing all users on a small subnet to connect, or allowing all users in a larger network to connect to the database foo. Next up is create role with no login, uh, which is the same as create group. Uh, it creates a group with um, specified permissions that users can be assigned to, such as um, an administrative group, so on and so forth. As it pertains to authorization, it has parameters to set permissions for replication, create DB, superuser, and create role. So for example, if you wanted to create a user with superuser privileges, uh, you would just create role, starman, login, superuser. Um, you can also create an administrative group and assign Saruman to it. So you create, first create the role admin, no login super user, grant admin to Saruman. Um, you can um, alter the role Saruman to inherit, which allows the user to inherit database object privileges. Um, and then if you change user to Saruman, if you want to be able to also have the same abilities as the administrative group, such as being able to create a database, uh, you'd have to set role to admin. <coughs> so you then have uh, grant revoke. This defines and removes access privileges to database objects or grants and revokes role membership. You can grant privileges on tables, columns, views, databases, sequences, domains, foreign data wrappers, so on and so forth, basically all the database objects. And you can also grant membership in a role. By default, schema level privileges are disabled, and they have to be granted in addition to table level permissions. So an example of this would be to grant all privileges on schema mortar to the group role admin. First create the schema, create the table mortar.ring, grant all privileges on schema mortar to admin, and they should be able to access.
Um, a quick mention about creating a role with the ability to log in. It's important to understand what, by default, ordinary users are um, authorized to do and how a revoke can assist in preventing chaos caused by a compromised account. Ordinary users can create user-defined functions, execute user-defined functions created by other users in the public schema, create objects in the public schema, alter runtime parameters, and create temporary objects um, in temporary sessions. Finally, they can, of course, access any database if um, pghba.conf uses the default trust setting. Um, so if you're worried about securing your database, it's essential, of course, to change this to something a bit more secure. Um, I should also mention that they're not authorized to create a database schema or other users, nor can they access objects created by other users. So quite a bit of grief can be caused just with the default permissions, so it's advisable to set preventative measures, uh, such as revoking all privileges from the public schema. So you can revoke all privileges on the public schema from Sermon, so he would no longer be part of that. You can revoke all, um, all privileges on the function foo from the group public. Um, if there's a particular function, for example, you didn't want accessed. Um, and then you can also revoke all the privileges on schema public from public, basically making it inaccessible um, and therefore avoid all that entirely. Then you have altered default privileges, which allows you to def define your own default privileges. Um, if you want to drop a role after altering them, by the way, you have to um, either reverse the changes first or use dropped owned by to drop the entry for the role. And then you should be able to um, drop it. So for example, if you wanted to grant select to everyone for all tables that you create under Schema Mordor, you should be able to alter default privileges in Schema Mordor to grant select on tables to public. And that would be the default setting. Um, now we're to accounting, um, inspecting privileges. Um, these are access privilege um, inquiry functions. So you can have um, PG has role, has any column privileges, um, has database privilege, has column privilege, so on and so forth for um, most of the database objects. You can go to the link below for the full list. Um, if the ar user argument is omitted, the current user is assumed. So if you wanted to see if Frodo had table privilege on border.ring, you would issue that command and you can get the result below. Apparently he does. There's a few useful commands in psql for inspecting privileges such as backslash dp, uh, ddp, and du. Um, they all display um, information on database objects, um, default privilege assignments, and um, existing roles. Uh, there's several more useful commands at the documentation below. Uh, now we're back to postgresql.conf. There's a section under there um, called logging and messaging options. Uh, the, these are parameters which can help with auditing the database. So you have log destination, log directory, and log file name, which are all parameters used to locate log files. Um, there's log connections, uh, log PID, log statement, log duration, and log timestamp, uh, which are all parameters which you can set to true or false uh, to either log or not log the respective items accordingly. Um, you have debug print parse, debug print rewritten, uh, debug print plan, uh, uh, which all enable various debugging output to be sent to the server log. Um, if flagged. It's useful for detecting um, slow queries or if you're in an interactive log, watching when procedures hang, uh, because you can sometimes see the exact point at which the step hangs. Uh, and you also have debug pretty print, which indents the extremely long uh, log output and makes it much more readable, but also much longer. Um, you also have hostname lookup, which if turned on, it will show the hostname. Um, by default, it's turned off, so only the IP address is shown. However, if the DNS is not local, or even if it is, um, it delays the new connection significantly and not recommended to turn on. So then you have CSV log, which displays log, log lines from imported log files in a single file with the option to import them into a convenient database table. 
It's an easy, efficient way to view all logs at, all at once rather than individually um, and it displays many different aspects of the logs, basically anything you could possibly want, including you know, timestamp, username, database name, process ID, um, so on and so forth. So if you want to import it, you would copy Postgres log from um, full path to log file with CSV. And you can also set log file name and log rotation age to assist in predicting what the file name will be and know when the individual files will, are ready to be imported. And you can also set log truncate on rotation to on to ensure old data is not mixed with the new. Uh, you have, there's a new feature in Postgres um, 9.3. Uh, it's still being expanded. Um, it's capable of capturing DDL events, and it's global to a specified um, database. And it can be written in any procedural language with event trigger support, but not in straight SQL. Uh, there is, uh, I thought I included a link. The PG audit on GitHub is based off of event triggers. If you want to look that up. Right here. PG audit. It's based on event triggers and it collects auditing events and logs in CSV log format. Um, it supports DDL, DML, and, util and utility commands. Then you also have um, audit trigger. This is another add on for Postgres. Um, it's attached to a single table and captures DML events. Um, it's audit um, dash trigger on GitHub. Um, and generates an audit trigger for each table in the database. It can easily be modified. And the final add-on for Postgres would be PG um, Badger. It's an add-on that analyzes logs, um, system logs, and produces results showing reports such as statistics, queries by type, um, slowest queries, most frequent errors, and connections um, and sessions per database user client. It seems to be mostly performance oriented, but it can also be useful for auditing the database for security issues. And I unfortunately ran short, and I'm not sure how, so <laughs> a bit embarrassing. <laughs> That's it. I had a couple of questions. Yep. Yeah. So, um, how do you deal with uh, certificate, uh, intermediate certificates for CAs? Uh, what do you mean? Where would you put in intermediate? So going back to your SSL slide, you talked about where to put the certificate authority certificate. But yeah. You have intermediate CAs too. I'm unsure. Okay. Pretty sure you put that also in the CA file. I don't think it would go in the server file. Yeah. I think I remember reading about that. I didn't do very much research on that for the since it wasn't applying to my sure. presentation. Fair enough. Any other questions? No? Okay. I, I did have one. Oh, okay. One. Um, so on the certificate, the client, is there a client side mapping that you can also assign, or do you give a certain client, say, a SSL? Yeah. I haven't done that before. But. Yeah, there is. So the way that that works is with uh, PG IDEN. Are you talking about mapping like a CN to a, a role name? Yeah. Yeah, that, that you do use PG IDEN to uh, do that mapping. Uh, PG IDENT is a, a generic file for doing role mapping, where you can map from um, whatever you consider the whatever the authentication method considers the system authentication system name. You can map that to different role names. And in fact, you can use it to, you know, if you want to be able to log in as root to like the Postgres user, you can have an entry in there um, in PG IDENT that'll allow you to authenticate directly using like the peer authentication method. But that's how you deal with mapping a CN to a, uh, a Postgres role. Okay, so I mean, like in, in that example, I have replication users that are, you know, for my slave database, mm -hmm. and that can be separate authentication role than, say, like my, you know, my actual end user type connection. Yeah, yeah, you can also define, mm -hmm. so each entry in the PGHBA uh, file, you can actually uh, add to it a map argument, so MAP equal at the end of it, and then you can have different maps defined in that PG IDENT file. Oh. So if you have like on the PGHBA line for replication, you could have that using one map inside of PG IDENT and then have 
you know, a regular host line for a host database line for regular users that uses a different map file. You know, and maybe uh, because maps tend to be uh, authentication method specific, it just makes sense. So if you have a system that's you know complicated where you have like Kerberos authentication happening and you also have client side certificates happening, you could have two different maps defined inside of PGI den and then just use the right one for the authentication method that that, that set of users is using, whether it's Kerberos or uh, or client side certificates or whatever. Uh, not as far as I know, um, I'm assuming just look for any, um, anything else which would, um, I, like if it's important, make it, put it near the top of the file, so that way it'll pick that one first, and then use the other one as like a backup. So for example, if you had one that allows all connections to a particular database, but you had one connection you wanted rejected, you would put that before the one that allows all of them. Anything else? Uh, you. Um, password setting like uh, complexity and history and scale or lifetime. Um, is, is that handled on a global scale or? Um, I I believe so. So in Postgres, we don't have any of that for the passwords that are in Postgres, basically. There is a password. You can have a password so book that you can do that with. There's also a function that will do. Right, and you can have accounts that expire. And generally, when you have an environment that has those kinds of requirements, a lot of times there's an enterprise authentication system like Active Directory. And if you're using an enterprise authentication system like Active Directory, use it and use Kerberos to authenticate to the database because that's how you authenticate to all of the Active Directory services. So, you know, if you need that, I mean, the other option is to just you know, you could set up your own KDC and get all of that from, from a Kerberos-based environment, or you can use client-side certificates, you know, which addresses that issue. But in terms of Postgres, the only other way to do that is basically use TAM, which is a authentication method. But you can't use it with TAM Unix because Postgres doesn't run with root. So you have to use, like, TAM PGSQL, which is kind of an interesting twist. But then you can also, with that, you can stack all of your PAM modules that do password aging and remember old passwords and, and all of that kind of stuff that PAM allows you. So that's the way you would address it with Postgres.
Uh, not very long. Um, I've only been using it for maybe uh, six months to a year at most. Uh, <laughs> I'm 17 years old. I'm studying a network administration um, at a community college right now. I should be graduating next year with uh, two associates in networking. Um, however, I'm, I'm trying to learn, the mo learn as much as I can about Postgres, and I actually am very interested in security. Uh, which is why I would wanted to do a security talk for beginners. Uh, this is all stuff I was hoping to learn when I first started out. So I just wanted to share. 